Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome to this cozy spot. I have set myself up so that I can be comfortable because we're gonna be here for a little while. This is going to be my tarot frequently asked questions or hashtag tarot FAQ. You're more than welcome to participate and do VRs if this is stuff that you are interested in and you don't have to answer all the questions. You can just pick and choose the ones that make sense to you or that resonate with you or that you wanna answer or I can just share with you mine and I'm super cool with that. So I have a lot of things in front of me because as I was reviewing the questions I compiled, I was like, I need props. So, and I'm rambly, but I have my own beverage. So make sure you're cozy, no guarantees on length of time. So we're gonna be talking about questions in four categories. My deck preferences, so these are things I like or don't like in decks, that sort of thing. My sort of habits around buying and backing decks. We're gonna talk about my reading style and we're gonna be talking about my experiences or my thoughts on questions around reading for clients. So let's dive in, I have so much to say. I'm literally just hanging out in my loungewear and I've done nothing to make myself pretty for this. This is just me as I am on a weekend day when I'm filming this. So first sec section of questions are deck preferences. And the first question I wrote down are, what are your thoughts on illustrated minors versus pips? So this is one of those things that's definitely evolving for me. I used to be very much like always illustrated minors. And by that, what I mean is scenic minors. So when you have decks where the seven of wands for example or the six of wands for example is illustrated right you have a scene on the card versus pip cards where you have pips whether it be a marseille deck whether it be just a regular pip deck and there have been some pip decks that have been growing on me lately and actually more than that i feel like reading with pips has been growing on me lately one that i've been really falling in love with lately is the tattoo tarot um ink and intuition so the backings look like that these are freaking gorgeous and I've been finding lately that when I read I'm really enjoying working with pip decks pretty regularly. I will say that for the most part I gravitate towards decks that have illustrated minors because I just love all the extra artwork but I'm finding that I actually feel a little out of sorts if I don't have a pip deck handy especially when I'm doing live readings on my second channel. I feel like I always want one of my decks to be a pip deck. Mostly I feel like I want something that feels kind of neutral and I also find I tend to reach for pip decks more for practical questions or for questions where I want to make sure that the deck is going to be neutral and not have too much bias and pip decks are great for that because they don't that you just have a two of wands and then I lean more into say numerological meanings than really intuitively diving into the artwork and there's something clean about that that I really enjoy in certain contexts so I would say more and more I've been loving pip decks. I don't see myself ever ditching illustrated pips in order to read with non-illustrated pips or non-scenic pips, but I do really enjoy them now and I, they have a place in my collection and there was a time when I wouldn't buy a deck if it had non-scenic minors. If it was just pips, I wasn't even remotely interested and that's definitely changed a lot in the last couple years. So that, oh, that was a long answer. We're only one question in guys. <laughs> Second question, how do you feel about keywords on decks? I love keywords as long as I agree with the keywords. And this is the trap for tarot deck creators, I think, is that if you put keywords on a deck and somebody doesn't resonate with those keywords, it's going to be a distraction and it'll be hard for them to work with the deck. But there are a few decks where I feel like this is done really well. The first one I'm going to bring up is actually really controversial, and that is the Brady Tarot by Emmy Brady. This deck, I know lots of people were actually really disappointed about the keywords, but I love them on this deck. And I actually, I actually really find that they help, particularly in decks where, like in this case, it's an animal and nature based deck. And whereas I might not immediately understand what's happening in the card, like I definitely do in a card like the Eight of Feathers here, or the Eight of Wands. This is the Swiftness card. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, okay, I totally get that, right? Like that, that makes sense. But I feel like they add something in a lot of cases to decks like this where I might, I don't know, maybe not struggle is the right word, but where I just appreciate them more. Like I love rivalry in the Five of Wands. But again, if I disagreed with a lot of the keywords, this would end up being a deal breaker because it would be too distracting and it would pull me away from what I feel like the meaning of the card is. But this is a deck where it actually really, really works for me and where I know for a fact it hasn't worked for some other people. When I was thinking about what decks I wanted to show for this, the one that came to mind the most for a deck where I really love the keywords and I feel like they don't only, they, they not only like sort of 
help you hone in on the meaning, but in this case, the keywords in this deck, I feel like they actually add something to the meaning, and that is in the Tarot of the She uh, by Emily Carding. So my copy of this deck is trimmed, so I should keep this handy for that question. Um, but these have really just, they're interesting keywords, and I feel like they definitely add to the deck, or add to the card and the artwork. So here in Dreamer 9, which is the Nine of Swords, it says, oh, there's a glare, Nightmare. The keywords here are just beautiful. Yeah, so the Warrior Queen, who is our Queen of Wands, has the gift of charm. And I feel like, again, that's so perfect. The Warrior Princess, so this is like the Page of Wands, has the gift of courage. And I just think that's, yeah, gift of liberty for the Prince, the Dreamer Prince, who is the Prince of Swords. It, to me, it's very smart, and it really feels like it gives the deck more personality in a way. On Oracle decks, I love keywords and in fact it's rare that I get a oracle deck that doesn't have keywords and some of my favorites are Anna Turian's Oracle of Echoes which has fantastic keywords just fantastic um, a couple of other favorite oracle decks for having really good expansive keywords are um Clara Max uh, Illuminated Earth Oracle oh my gosh the keywords in this deck are so good evolution resistance so I'm doing a terrible job of holding these up. Memory, disguise, attachment. I mean, the keywords in Illuminated Earth are so good. Connection. They're so expansive and they give you so much room to kind of let your intuition go. And I love Oracle decks that do that really, really well. And another favorite for that, and probably if I had to pick just one Oracle deck, this would probably be the one that I would grab for because it's so multi-purpose is the Roots and Wings Oracle deck. A lot of people have talked about this one, but it is so, so good. Um, you have keywords like Potential, Union. This is a very tarot-like um, Oracle deck too. Mystery, Inner Vision, Drifting, Rise, Vulnerability, and the artwork is great too, but like, I, if I, I, I go to Oracle decks for extra intuitive messages, things that may not show up directly in a tarot deck. So I want expansive keywords. I want things that I can like chew on that I can like my intuition. I'm literally throwing my decks in front of me on my bed. Um, so I want things that are going to like get my intuitive, like mind going, my intuition going. And so yeah, love keywords in Oracle decks. So I really like keywords when they're done well. And when I agree with them, that's sort of the punchline I guess of the answer how do you feel about borders <laughs> so I there's a lot of things where my answers aren't going to be super clear-cut I like borders sometimes and I don't like borders sometimes and I'm not entirely sure if I know exactly the criteria every single time for example in the Alice Tarot by Baba Studio where the artwork actually sort of interacts with the border so you get the, the artwork actually overlaps the border and it peeks out of the borders. And this happens also in some of Chiro Marchetti's decks. And it gives the deck like this three-dimensional look like you're almost like these characters are literally jumping out at you. It makes it so, so magical and I freaking love that. I think it just gives the deck a ton of life. And especially in this Alice deck, it feels like it just, it literally feels like here's the Knight of Swords and he's like charging at you almost. And it's just, it's such an intense, beautiful way to to show the cards I really love I love this deck in general but I love the use of borders and the interplay with the borders for sure and there's some decks I didn't bring any other examples I don't think but there's some decks where they're really busy um, and the borders help to kind of contain it a bit um, such as in Paulina Cassidy's artwork I don't feel like I would trim any of her decks I feel like any of that artwork can be very busy and it feels like it needs the border to sort of hem it in Sometimes even really gigantic borders just feel right with the deck. I didn't grab it, but the Art of Love Tarot, I've seen that trimmed. I may even someday trim it, but for right now I enjoy its bigness, and so I don't want to trim the borders off. Other times, I feel like the borders have to go. So one example of that was with my um, Happy Tarot. This was a this is a low scarabeo deck. Now this deck actually comes now. The current versions of this deck that exist only have a border along the bottom edge, and they're borderless on all three sides. And then there's just like a little symbol. But mine actually, my copy actually had borders all the way around. And this is a Rider Waite Smith clone, but it's very like sort of Candyland, playful, super cute. And I 
it just, it needed to be borderless, <laughs> you know? This deck needed to be borderless. It had such vivid colors and it felt constrained without the borders. Um, or excuse me, with the borders. So I had to take them off. I didn't have to, but I wanted to, right? Another example I was just showing you was the Tarot of the She. This had these thick black borders all the way around and I trimmed the sides off and I took a little bit off the, did I take a little bit off the top and the bottom? I think I did. I can't fully remember. Um, so because I really wanted to keep the titles of the cards and the keywords because I love the keywords, but I wanted to take the sides off. It both made the deck more manageable size wise and it just opened up the artwork a bit, right? I just really liked that. I really liked the difference that it made. And this sort of bleeds into the question of what makes you decide to modify a deck. For me, I decide to modify to add something to it to bond with the deck or if I really feel like it would be easier to handle or more comfortable in a different size or without borders, for example. Um, the two main types of modifications that I do and I think that a lot of people do is either edging the deck, which I do a lot of the time. So if a deck has black um, borders at all, I'll typically edge the deck in black. So here in the case of the Happy Tarot, I edged it in all of these different shades of purple to match the backings. And edging a deck to me is such a great bonding activity and it adds a little personality and flair to the deck and it just makes it more fun to pick up and play with and it gives me a chance to just kind of sit and hang out with the deck while I'm doing the modification and I feel like that always helps me to get a little closer to the deck or to feel more bonded to it but as far as trimming usually what will make me decide to trim is if there's something about the deck that's not feeling as nice as it could be so in the case of my guardian angel tarot I saw Don Michelle at Boho Tarot do a trim of that deck and she did it to take the gilding off and it elevated the deck so much and I ended up doing that same modification on my deck. I trimmed the gilding off and then I applied soft pastel colors to the edges and it just softened the deck. It made it more comfortable to hold and it was just really nice. I don't always feel like I want to trim decks and oftentimes if a deck feels very classic, um, like with the case of say a Marseille deck or a classic Rider Waite Smith or like this deck, um, this tattoo tarot, I don't feel, I feel like the borders are a part of the experience with some of these classic decks, decks that feel older. And I also have not yet trimmed a deck that I knew was out of print. That may be changing in the future because I have a deck in mind that I really do want desperately to trim, but I'm scaredy cat. So I'm waiting a little longer, but um, I think I'm going to do it on that case. But so that's something else. And the thing is, I realized though, is that a lot of these decks that I have trimmed are eventually going to go out of print and then I will have an out of print trimmed deck. So I don't know what my issue is there. I feel like I need to kind of get over it a little bit, but yeah. What kind of cardstock is your favorite? So this is another area where I'm kind of, I'm kind of all over the map. I love Baba Studios cardstock. I was just showing you my um, Alice Tarot. Okay, so the thing about Baba Studios cardstock is everybody says it's great and then you get a Baba Studios card deck um, and it feels super thin and flimsy. Like it doesn't feel like particularly exciting, but it's, it's, it, it makes the deck so easy to handle. It like, I don't know, there's something about it. Like it's got a, a really good flex to it. It shuffles easy. It smells really good. <laughs> I am a deck sniffer. I should have put a question in there about smelling decks. Bonus question. Do you sniff your decks? I totally sniff mine. I do. Um, and there's something about Baba Studios decks specifically that smell really good. And I don't know if it's the like, cold foil stamping that they do or the inks that they use or something, but it smells real good. I'm just saying. It's a thing. So I really like that cardstock, but I wouldn't hail it as like my favorite. I think my favorite cardstock so far is a really buttery, silky, smooth, coated, matte cardstock. The Revival Art um, cardstock by Taroko Studio. So this is a very thin, bendy cardstock. In fact, the deck itself has a bit of a bow, but it's very smooth. Um, I wouldn't mind if it was thicker, but I think what I like about this cardstock is the coating. And I think it's called Silk Matte. I mean, I think I mentioned that already. I think it's called Silk Matte. It feels, it feels really smooth. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, it's, it's matte. But it's a coating of some kind and it gives it like a little bit of a slip i don't know how else to describe it it's not slidey at all these cards are like not too thick they shuffle really beautifully um they're lovely so i love that a thicker version of that same kind of feeling goes to goes to like i'm giving out awards a quick a deck that's quicker quicker a deck that is thicker 
that has that same feeling on it is the Mermaid Tarot by Dame Darcy. So this, these card, this cardstock is thicker, but it has that same like, I want to call it buttery. I don't know what else to call it, but it's like a, a smooth, I'm petting my cards on camera. This is what I'm doing right now. But yeah, it's like a smooth cardstock. I don't know how else to describe it. But this deck, it's thick. It has a really beautiful antique gilding. I didn't give myself a question about gilding. My opinions on gilding, I'm going to just tell them to you because apparently you want all my opinions today. And I'm only like one section of the questions in and I've been on here for a long time. Okay, I love matte gilding because it feels really sturdy. It doesn't tend to chip and it doesn't tend to hurt. And I like a really high quality shiny gilding. But the shiny gilding has to hold up well. My least favorite kinds of gilding are cheap shiny gilding that chips super fast and sparkly gilding. Now the sparkly gilding where it kind of sheds on your hands, a lot of times after you've worked with those cards for a bit, it almost becomes like these matte ones where it doesn't come off, but sometimes it does and then it just feels cheap. This feels really nice, but this cardstock, it's thick, it shuffles really nicely, it feels really sturdy, it's not too stiff, but it's that like matte but still smooth that I really love. And I have to at least do a little bit of a shout out for rose petal finish. So here's the thing about rose petal finish. I really love cards that have rose petal finish. But when you're shuffling them, so yeah, this is the Star Child um, reprinted first edition. This is really nice. So this has that same sort of um, matte gold gilding. The thing about a rose petal finish, when rose petal finish first came out, when you shuffled the cards and you went to push them together, you had to really like fight them together. They just didn't want to go together. This one's a little bit like that, but I've noticed that the last couple decks I've gotten, this one and the Star Seeker Tarot, the rose petal feels just a little bit smoother. It doesn't feel quite so grippy. So when you go to put the cards back together, they go back together a little nicer. And that is definitely, I would say, my favorite as far as rose petal finish goes. I, even though it doesn't shuffle as nicely and I am a, a riffle shuffler, the way that a rose petal finish cardstock feels to me is so nice that I'm willing to put up with that stickiness during the shuffle because I enjoy the way that the cards feel to handle them. So I don't mind the rose petal finish. Where do you go to look for new decks you may want to buy? So there's a few places. Because I have a large collection, I'm sometimes looking for decks I haven't heard of or secondhand decks or decks that people are trading, that kind of thing, because that's one of the ways I find out about more unique decks. So I will look at Craigslist, I'll look at Facebook Marketplace and see if anybody in my area is rehoming anything. That's one thing that I look at. Um, I also definitely keep an eye out on upcoming new releases through Amazon, through Book Depository, through local bookshops, and on Kickstarter. I will also check upcoming decks. Every once in a while I will browse things at Make Playing Cards or Game Crafter, which are both print your own decks companies. And you can browse their marketplaces where the average, like anybody can basically go on there and create a deck. And so you can sometimes find some really unique things in places like that. And finally, I will check Etsy because a lot of independent deck creators, even if they've kickstarted a deck, when they've got extra stock, they will put them on their Etsy shop. And since Etsy is a marketplace for handmade goods, it just makes a really good place to browse and look for unique or independent decks. Lastly, another place that I will check is indie deck re reviews on Instagram or just generally perusing tarot related Facebook groups and tarot related Instagram accounts because people will share about new and up upcoming decks in those places typically. So as my social media feeds have been curated with more and more tarot related kind of things, I tend to find out about more and more tarot stuff. Okay, so the next question is, what has been your best and worst Kickstarter or crowdfunding experience. I don't know if it's fair to use this one because it's so new out and it's ha it hasn't been fulfilled yet, but I'm going to talk about it anyways. So right now, the one that comes to mind as my best is my experience backing the Cosmovisions Oracle. That was the most fun I've ever had backing on Kickstarter because the creator was regularly updating. On top of that, there was all of these stretch goals, there was a lot of momentum, and he just kept James R. Eads, the creator of the Cosmo Visions, who is the creator of the Prisma Visions and the Light Visions Tarot decks, he just kept like upping his game and like adding more freebies and more stretch goals and more add-ons that you could purchase. And it was just exciting and dynamic and fun to be on that campaign. So that's definitely one of the best. I haven't gotten my deck yet, but his communication has been incredible so far and I've been really comfortable the whole way through. I can't remember how many decks I have 
backed that have been like on time versus late because when I back a Kickstarter for the most part I assume it's going to take a bit of time and I don't to me when it does show up it's like a happy surprise it's like oh yeah I had a Kickstarter that's so fun I feel like I've had a lot of really great Kickstarter experiences where even when there's delays the, the creator just takes responsibility and they communicate proactively one Kickstarter I'm on where I don't have the deck yet but I'm about to at the time I'm filming this video is the Oak Ash and Thorn tarot deck and the creator of that deck has just weekly updates even if there's not a lot to report weekly updates and that has just been really cozy and comfortable to go like oh yeah here's our weekly update and it just means that I don't sit here wondering when is my gonna my deck gonna show up because by the time I could think about it I've already heard so I get updates all the time feeling super comfortable I don't even find myself looking back at my Kickstarter campaigns to see when the deck was supposed to ship unless I'm feeling uncomfortable so whenever I'm doing a Kickstarter campaign and the creator is keeping people posted I don't care if it's super late it's just this like constant accountability and communication that seems to make all of the difference because if I'm getting constant communication it doesn't even occur to me to see to go check and see when the deck was expected and I think that to me has been the real key I also find that decks that I back on Kickstarter where I know the art is near completion or completed at the time that the funding happens I feel a lot more comfortable in general because I know there's unlikely to be huge delays. The two sort of worst crowdfunding experiences I had, the first one was the last Unicorn Tarot. Now this was a Kickstarter that was done by a company called Geekify. It was a massively overfunded campaign so I was very relaxed in the sense that I recognized that because it's so overfunded they had a lot more to do than they originally bargained for so I expected things to take a little longer than usual. But Near the latter part of the campaign, communication just completely fell apart. It felt like we weren't getting updates, and it just wasn't there. We would go a long time without updates. In the meantime, this is a company that was also pushing us emails about other products that they were coming out with that was also licensed Last Unicorn merchandise that they were developing and working on. And while I logically understood that while they're waiting for decks to be printed, for example, that these other projects were things they're working on when they can't be working on the tarot, it felt like this campaign was taking so long and they kept trying to sell us more things while the campaign was still ongoing. I don't think there's anything necessarily inherently wrong about that. It just felt as though it was taking longer than it should and that part of that was because they wanted to get all these other add-ons put together. And there wasn't enough communication to make us, to make people I think in general feel more comfortable that that's not what was happening. On top of that, they were out on the trade show market and they were showing this deck to people. They had physical copies and it just got really frustrating because they still hadn't shipped Kickstarter back to decks. With that being said, I can give a lot of forgiveness because the deck was so superb quality when it did come in and it was worth the wait but man the communication was terrible so that one was a, was disappointing but the product was incredible when I got it in my hands and it made forgiving that process a little bit easier and the other one that wasn't so great was similar and it was the wise dog tarot by MJ Coolinane and she's a sweetheart the, pr the problem there was that the art wasn't done and I do believe that when it comes to art if you try to pressure or rush art it's going to be not good so while I got it I learned from that experience that if I'm going to back a deck I want the deck the artwork to be mostly or completely done before I back it I'll have the patience I just <laughs> like I just don't have the patience so, and again, that was one where the communication I felt like wasn't as good as it should have been. That was not a Kickstarter, that was an Indiegogo. And I rarely back on Indiegogo now. If I'm going to back a deck, it will typically be on Kickstarter. Whew, I had a lot of feels about that one. All right, so the next question. How do you decide what decks you want to buy or back? It has to catch my attention. So it has to feel different in some way. Typically, um, the theme or the artwork quality or the artwork style has to be something that I'm really drawn to. I want to know that it's a deck that I feel like I'm really going to resonate with. And nowadays, more than ever, I feel like I usually back Kickstarters when I feel like I'm genuinely going to be sad if there aren't any extras. I'm trying to be better at being okay with taking my chances unless the deck feels like I really resonate super strongly with it. So I've gotten much pickier. Which brings us to how much is too much to spend on a deck. 
So cop out answer is I don't think there's really a limit if it's something that you think you're going to truly treasure and it's something you can in your own personal life afford. But usually I'm working within a certain budget and as long as a deck is within the amount of available like liquid cash budget that I have set aside, I'm usually pretty comfortable with spending it as long as it feels like I'm going to get the value out of it. Depends how niche the, the, the deck is, how much I'm willing to spend on it. If it feels like something I can use all the time, like my This Might Hurt Tarot, which I can't reach, but I kind of wanted to. That one is like a Rider Waite Smith clone. It's super diverse. It's modern. It's relatable. And I can pull it for any client reading. That one, I would have easily spent double what I spent for it just because I, I'm using it so much. And as I start to learn which decks I can do that with and which decks feel like they'll get more mileage in a way, I get I'm willing to spend more. Um, I'm also willing to spend more for quality, for durability, so if it comes with a, a nicer box or if the card stock is nicer, I'm willing to spend more for those things because I know that those are things I appreciate, genuinely appreciate about decks. When um, a deck that is currently available, so one that is not out of print, gets above like, with shipping included, gets to about 115, 120 Canadian, I'm like really hesitating. Most indie decks end up costing me between $75 and $110, somewhere in that ballpark, because Canadian dollar, 35% or so higher than the American dollar. So if you're spending $50, I'm probably spending $85. It just is what it is. And then you add shipping to Canada on top of that, and I'm just used to spending a little bit more for independent decks. When it comes to mass market decks, as long as it's like 40 or under, I'm usually like pretty quick to hit buy if I think it's something I'm going to use. If it's over 40 and it's a mass market deck, I have to think about it a little bit. My threshold is definitely lower for mass market decks than it is for independent decks. Do you have deal breaker cards? Cards that have to feel right to you to pull the trigger on a deck. What are they? So I do kind of have deal breaker cards, but I will break my own rules if overall I really, really like the deck. So a deck that happened to tick all of my boxes when it com comes to my deal breaker cards is the Star Seeker Tarot by Nikki Ferrata. Um, so the, the most important cards to me, as far as really wanting to like them, is number one, the Nine of Cups. This is a card that just means a lot to me, and this one I have to like. I don't have to love it, but I have to at least find it acceptable. Um, this is my favorite Nine of Cups. Probably one of my two favorites. One is the Sasurai Bito Tarot. This is another one. This shows somebody under a grandma willow tree in a pool of water surrounded by nine cups. Like it's, it's such a bliss moment and she looks so content and peaceful. This is exactly what Nine of Cups feels like to me. And this card is important to me because I do a lot of work with this sort of energy where I feel like Nine of Cups is that manifestation card for emotional fulfillment and happiness and joy. And this just, this just does it. Um, so yeah, the other ones are cards that I associate more with myself or my spiritual practice. One of those being the Page of Cups, which is usually my significator in a tarot deck. I really want to feel like this one works and that I'm I can see myself in it in some way and here we have somebody we have like a little figure here on the beach and is looking out and there's a mermaid out at sea like it's just I love it um, and I also really want to like the Queen of Cups because that to me is the more embodied or more mature side of that Page of Cups energy and another card that I tend to identify with depending on the circumstance whether I'm more Page of Cups or Queen of Cups it just kind of depends so those are like the first three that I feel like I always always look for other ones that I feel like I definitely don't want to dislike are the hermit because I just feel like I need to see a wise old crone or old man in this image um somebody that I feel like connects to that feeling of wisdom and aging yes have to like that card or at least be okay with it the star card because this is one of my birth cards the strength card for the same reason I didn't grab it here the death card I feel like a death card that I don't like has tended to be something that sours me on a deck and the tower card. If the tower lets people me off the hook too easy, I tend to not, I tend to have issues reaching for that deck. So those are some examples of some of my personal deal breakers. I have made exceptions before, um, and most of the time it's like I just have to be able to make a case for the card. It doesn't have to be one that I love. But decks where I love those cards, I tend to get on with much better. Do you have a daily tarot practice? And if not, when do you read for yourself? Yes, I do have a daily tarot practice. Most of the time these days, it is either I draw a tarot card for the day and an oracle card for the day, and those are my things to be aware of that day, 
or most mornings now I do the um, morning cup spread which I've talked about before and if I remember I will link in the description box down below so that you can see it for yourself but it is a mug shaped spread that involves five positions I use four for tarot one for oracle so the four are on the bottom are what can ground me today or what will ground me today what can be built on or improved upon today and then the two top cards are what to be mindful of today and how to make a positive difference today and then where the handle of the mug would be is where I pull an oracle card and that is the energy of the day so that works really well for me and sometimes I've also used Lenormand where the handle of the mug would be and I draw two cards for the energy of the day and that also works really well for me and I love that practice it feels like it gives me a lot to chew on and I just I enjoy it I also read for myself often at bedtime I will draw a card when I'm working with deity I will draw cards and I have certain rituals I do around those things when I want to do spirit communication I will draw cards or if I have a specific question situation conflict or something else I'm navigating I will definitely draw cards so those are my go-to's for myself um What's your go-to shuffle style? I am a riffler. I love me a good riffler. And if you've ever um, watched me shuffle on screen, the way I typically will shuffle is I will do a riffle from the top, like that. And then I will turn the deck sideways on my table and I'll bridge like that. And I'll let the cards kind of fall down onto the table as I bridge them. Um, I'll also just do a hand over hand shuffle like and I usually do a mix of both of these when I'm reading so I'll usually do a little bit of hand over hand and a little bit of riffling and right before I pull cards I will always do one single cut and put the bottom half uh, like pull the top part of the cards off and put them on the bottom and then read from that spot so that's typically my shuffle style um, how do you choose which deck you're going to work with I have two ways <laughs> I either choose intuitively three ways. I either choose intuitively, thematically, or randomly. So if I am pulling for a client, I will usually pull intuitively for a deck that I feel like is good for that situation, that question, um, sometimes multiple decks based on how they'll work together or what I think they'll bring that client in that specific situation. I also will choose thematically. So if I have a client who's coming to me with a, for a self-worth reading, I'm going to pull from decks that I feel like are very um, supportive and will bring some of those self-worth messages forward. Um, if I have right now at the time I'm filming this it is the month of October so the decks that I'm choosing to work with for myself are themed around Samhain and Halloween and I've got like my zombie tarot and my Samhain oracle and my Halloween oracle and those kinds of things that I'm reaching for. So that's what I mean by thematically. Um, I've had months where I work only with fairy tale themed decks. Or with only Marseille decks. Sometimes I run theme months for myself just to keep things interesting. Um, so randomly is when I load all of my decks into a random name picker and I will have it select for me what deck I'm going to work with. But usually as I'm working through my collection I'm bringing enough new things in or there's a reason to pull for a particular theme or I just want to work with a particular deck that I feel like I'm mindfully choosing more than anything for myself lately. But if I have nothing new coming in that I'm trying to rotate in or work with, then I'll usually do a random. I'll usually do a random. Or I'll pull something that I know I haven't pulled in a long time just to kind of reacquaint myself with it and get comfortable with it again. Um, do you purchase professional readings for yourself? I do, infrequently. I probably purchase a professional reading for myself once or twice a year, um, if that. And usually as sort of broad check-ins, unless I'm going through something and then that frequency may increase a bit. Uh, do you use tarot for anything other than divination? Yes, and I actually mentioned it before. I use, divina I use um, tarot for spirit work. I use tarot for um, spirit communication, for deity communication. I use it for mindfulness. I use cards as affirmations, as, as energy holders, as magical tools for spell work to hold correspondences to anchor the intention of magical work um tarot is such an expansive tool and so are oracle cards you can use them in so many different ways so it's rare that i do anything spiritual or magical where cards are not incorporated in some way um reading for clients how did you know you were ready to read for clients i don't think i did I think I read regularly for people in my life, for friends, for family, for acquaintances. Um, the first time I read in person in that way was I, um, I sort of mixed friend and 
friends, acquaintances, and I guess professional in a way, or for money. Um, when I had an event at my yoga studio, I had a tarot and tea event. I was like, this will be fun. I'll read for people that I kind of know. Um, so I had them come out. We They booked time slots. We pre-booked the slots, and then I just did the readings, and it was super fun. I've done that at yoga studios a couple of times, actually, and it's been a blast every time. I also, for a while, this was years ago, did online readings via email uh, through eBay. So I used to sell readings on eBay. This was a very long time ago. Um, so I would sell the reading. I would take, I would draw, do the cards for, my, for the client. I would take a picture, and I would do a full email write-up. I did readings um, on Etsy. I did, you know, all that stuff. But for me... Um, Knowing I was ready was, I think, just the more comfortable I got reading for other people in my life and the more I got feedback that these readings were resonating, that the messages were helpful, that when I felt like the messages were landing and when I definitely when I felt like I could trust my intuition and I could trust that I could say what came up and trust the person across the table from me to get what they needed out of that, the more that I trusted that, the more ready I felt to um, sell readings, I guess you could say. Do you do anything special to set up for a client reading or for yourself? I am really lazy for myself, but I go all out for my clients. So typically when I'm setting up for a client reading, I set the table, my reading table space up with certain corresponding items that are going to support and anchor the intention for the reading. So I will use um, crystals. I have a giant, well, kind of giant, heavy cauldron. This is full of stones, crystals, tumbles things like that. So I will select something out of here, usually anywhere from one to three crystals to support a client reading based on the properties of that crystal. Um, whatever I think that will help or support the client based on their question. This is my bad boy. I've had this crystal for 20 some odd years. This is a quartz. This, quart this quartz crystal in me, we are like, we're tight, we're bonded. So that one's out a lot, but um, definitely I will pull crystals to correspond with the reading. I'll also pull um, sigils from the Making Magic deck by Priestess Moon. I've talked about this a lot. I'll select one, two, or three sigils. Um, and or lately what I've actually started incorporating into my client readings are Ethany Dawn's The Muses of Tarot. So this has 13, I think it is. Yeah, 13 different archetypes. Each one sort of is focused around a different type of reading. And there is a muse. There's a um, like a altar card with correspondences, there's chakra cards, there's an invocation and evocation, and I've been enjoying pulling a muse in for client readings lately. I feel like it's helped me to anchor the intention of the reading and it's added to my client practice, so I've been really enjoying doing that. But whether it's making magic cards or tarot muses or both, I really enjoy having something on the table specific to my client situation or question that can really help me focus and anchor in to what it is that I'm reading about. I also use sprays, oils, and herbs. So I have a few sprays that are currently my go-tos. I have Michelle of EO Chakra Products Smudge Off Spray. I have only a little bit of this left. Um, Smokeless Sage Area Mist. This is a great cleansing spray. I have a Witch's Moon Serenity Aura Spray that I got in a Witch's Roots box, I believe. And I also have a Witch's Roots. This is a more recent one I've gotten, um, Amplify or a spray. So this one brings energy up. So I've got one to bring energy up, one to bring energy down, and then I've got like sort of a neutral spray that I use usually before and after a reading. Um, I also have a few oils that I use during my readings. I will usually oil my palms um, with one of two oils for my client readings. I use this seeker oil from the Witch's Moon. I feel like I use this in almost every single client reading and I've barely touched it but I just put a little bit on a fingertip, I put it in the center of my palms, I run my palms to rub my palms together. Um, and this is just for me, something to help me focus in on being the, um, the reader, the conduit. Um, and then also for past life readings and occasionally for other deeper kinds of readings, I will use this Psychic Sight Ritual Body Oil instead in the same exact way. I'll put some on my palms, rub my palms together. And I will also almost always use a little bit of this roll-on that Dustin at Modern Metaphysica made me. This is a protection oil. And I will usually actually, for some reason with protection oils, I will rub them on my tattoos, like on my forearm here, and I'll rub those together like that. That's where I tend to do protection oil application. So I will do all of that. I will light candles. That is what I do for clients. For myself, usually quick and dirty, not gonna lie. I usually throw down a cloth, throw down my cards, and I'm good to go. 
Do you let your client handle your cards? So do you shuffle and ask them to draw and cut? Have them shuffle or do you do it all? I've done all three of these. Most of the time I shuffle and have them cut if they are in person with me, um, if I let them touch them at all. But usually I feel comfortable letting my clients touch my cards. I don't necessarily want people like going through them, but I'm totally cool with them taking them, cutting them. And if it's somebody I know, I might have them shuffle. Are there any questions you would refuse to answer for a client? I will not do anything that is illegal. So I will not diagnose anything because I am not a doctor. I will not, um, I will not tell people I'll predict lottery numbers. I will not give financial advice. I will not give legal advice. Um, if somebody comes to me with a question where it's clear they need more support than that of a tarot reader, then I always make it very, very clear. I am a tarot reader. I am not a doctor. I am not a police officer. I am not a therapist. I'm not, a, you know, whatever it is that I feel like they also need. I would say, this is what I am. This is what I am not. And here's what I feel like you should also have in your circle. So here's some resources, or please make sure that you're tapped into those things as well. Um, I've read in for clients in some very sticky situations. And I always make it incredibly clear that I appreciate that they've come to me for a reading and I'm happy to help them. But that I have limitations of what I can do. And all I can really do is give them a little bit of support and helpful messages. I don't know if that makes sense. But like, I feel like my job is to always make it clear that this is what I can do, but this is definitely what I can't do. And also for legal reasons, I mean, I think it's important that anybody booking a reading understands that a reading at the end of the day, readings are always for enter entertainment purposes only. By which I mean that it's important to remember that this is a person putting cards on the table and telling you what those cards mean to them. And you can give it as much weight as you want, but I think always make sure that you are taking care of your practical concerns also. If you're in a, a situation that feels unsafe, make sure your safety is secured because a tarot reader can't do that, right? Um, if you're in a situation where you need legal advice, make sure you seek the help of a legal professional and not just, you know, or seek a resource for free legal advice or something. Um, because again, just a tarot reader. So yeah, I think that's, those are the kinds of answers I would refuse to, those are the kinds of questions I would refuse to answer are like medical, legal, um, financial, anything where I feel like somebody's looking to me for an answer that a professional should be giving them. Now, if they come to me for one of those kinds of questions and I say, well, I can't answer this question, but I can definitely read the energy around this situation for you. I can tell you how to best support yourself through this. Those are the kinds of things I would do in tarot, but I'm a little bit careful about making it clear, right? But in general, I'm, I'm happy to answer any question. I just always make it clear where I'm coming at it from. So somebody says, I actually had this come up somewhat recently, somebody asked about a twin flame and twin flames are not something that I personally have experience with or feel qualified to really speak about. So I will speak about the energy around a particular person or around a particular relationship or around finding that person that's meant for you, that kind of thing. So I, I just clarify that with whoever I'm reading for and see if they're comfortable with that. And if they are, then we go ahead and we're good. Lastly, do you have any advice for people who want to start reading professionally? I think if you want to read for clients, if you want to read for strangers, because I think this is really the big leap, right? There's le reading for people who you know feels one way. And then there's reading for people that you don't know. And that feels totally different. And I think for a lot of people, oh, my nose is so itchy. I think for a lot of people, it's like making that leap from reading for people that I know versus reading for people that I don't know. And it can be really scary because there's a fear of being wrong. There's a fear of of inaccuracy, there's a fear of, of judgment or of maybe not helping or maybe of doing damage. And I think if you are aware of your own, um, I think it's really important to be clear of your own boundaries and really clear on what you feel comfortable reading about what you don't. And then after that, I think, I think it's cool to do and and something that's worth doing is finding a way that you can practice reading for people you don't know well, where you're not accepting money at first. So in my case, oh my goodness, my nose is so itchy. In my case, I read for um, yoga clients who were interested, um, acquaintances who were interested. If a friend of mine brought somebody that I hadn't met before, I'd offer a reading. Um, I was quick to offer readings for people who I just didn't know very well because it was a great way to test my skills and build my confidence. Because when you're reading for somebody who you know, what happens in the back of your head is, am I reading the cards or am I reading like... Am I reading this based on what I know about this person or about, or, or am I reading based on my own opinions or am I actually reading what the cards say? And for me, that was something that I had to deal with 
And it was very validating for me actually when I would read for people that I know and then get messages coming through in the cards that did not match up with what I personally, what my personal opinions were. That was always very comforting because it's like, okay, I'm definitely reading the cards right now because I would tell this person something else entirely, but the cards are saying this. Um, but ultimately, I think if you're looking into starting this up, one of the best things you can do is find ways to practice. Lots of people do that by offering free re free reading somewhere. You can offer, re you can participate in reading swaps. A lot of uh, groups on Facebook will do things like that. You can offer free readings to people that you meet in real life if you're comfortable talking about that with people you know in real life. You could probably even put an ad in the paper on Craigslist saying you're doing free 10 minute readings to the first 20 people that contact you and ask for feedback. Not everybody will give you feedback and this is important to know. When you're practicing, sometimes you'll say, hey, I'm gonna give free readings to the first X amount of people. All I'm asking for in exchange is feedback. You will get people that will not give you feedback. It'll happen. Do it for the practice and do it because you wanna do it and hopefully you'll get people who will say, yeah, this made sense to me. This didn't, I liked how you did this, I didn't like how you did that. Most people are going to tend to be complimentary if they're giving you feedback directly because they don't want to say anything that's going to hurt your feelings. But I think if you make it really clear, that like you're open to all feedback, the reason you're doing this is for feedback, then you'll get some of that stuff. And you'll also find out as you read for different people in situations where they're bringing a question to you, you're not just trying to think of what the question might be, that you get a lot of practice too. Because people will ask you things you never expect. And then you can see what happens and how you go about doing that and what that looks like and what it feels like. And that's also how you can find out what, what questions you're comfortable asking and which are answering and which ones you might not be. You might find that there are certain questions people can ask you that just make you personally uncomfortable and you just may not want to go down that road. What if you don't want to answer questions about is this person faithful to me or not? You might not want to answer that question. That might not feel right for you. Um, there's opinions people have on whether they give third party readings. These are readings where the somebody's asking about somebody who's not present. For some people, that's an ethical boundary. Like this is a whole rabbit hole we could go down. But I guess my long winded advice is don't be afraid to practice. Don't feel like you have to have some sort of external um, validation that you're ready. As long as you feel ready, and you don't be afraid to like charge less in the beginning too so that you don't feel as much pressure and you can just and be honest always be honest I think this this makes such a difference be honest about how much experience you have be honest that you're new so that you know so that people know right that they're seeing somebody who's a little bit newer in the practice that goes a long way to building trust too right like just be honest about your level of experience be honest about what it is you're trying to do either just practice or whatnot and don't be afraid to get started. I think a lot of people get in their head about like, I'm not meant for this, or I couldn't possibly, or I don't have the right skill set. I think it's just like any other muscle that you can work out and exercise and build. It's a skill. You practice it over time. And I think a lot of reading for other people is just letting your own guard down and letting those intuitive messages come and not second guessing them. So yeah, that's my, that's my babble on all of that. And I was very long winded. So thank you for bearing with me. This was a lot of fun to just hang out on my bed and chat with you guys about all this stuff. So if you feel like doing a VR to a hashtag tarot FAQ, that'd be awesome. You could do it to just part of it or all of it, whatever questions you want to answer. I have questions here, like I said, on deck preferences, backing and buying decks, um, reading style and reading for clients, if that is something that you are doing. So I would love to hear from other people on these questions if you feel like it. But again, no pressure. This was just something I really wanted to do to share my answers to some of these commonly asked questions. So I think that's it. I'm going to wrap up for now. Please do hit the like button before you head out. Subscribe if you are new here. And remember, if you want to book a reading with me, you can always do that over at supportivetarot.com. Thank you so, so much. And I'll see you in the next one. And remember, may your magic always shine from the inside out. Bye, guys.